Appreciate that. Good to see everybody tonight and hope our discussion as we uh, continue in James chapter 1 uh, will be helpful, beneficial, and as always, y'all feel free and uh, comfortable to jump in and participate as you will. Uh, ask your questions or make your comments uh, as you uh, want to do so. We're going to spend uh, most of the class, I believe, on, on verses 5 through 8 of uh, chapter 1. Because we want to spend a little time on uh, prayer life, the importance of prayer life. And in this particular uh, uh, verse or verses, he's talking about asking for wisdom, the importance of asking for wisdom and the assurance that if we ask uh, in the right way, we ask in, in faith, belief in God, that he's going to provide wisdom. Now, that could branch out to other things as well. But he's uh, uh, specifically talking about wisdom in this particular um, context. But when we get into this a little bit, I want to talk about the, the various conditions of prayer, what we expect, what, what do we expect from God when we pray to him? Do we really believe uh, in prayer? I know we do. The uh, nine people in this room do. But I'm, just, I'm, I'm talking about kind of a general uh, a generic you, not not you specifically, but the importance of uh, prayer, the importance of the, the various conditions of prayer, what we expect from God uh, in uh, our prayer life, and uh, the, uh, the various uh, aspects or avenues uh, of prayer as we pray to God and, uh, uh, and ask Him for help, in particular in the various trials and tribulations because he's talked to James has started out talking about the trials and tribulations of life count it joy when all these things happen and we talked about that a little bit last week and Lloyd made a, a really good point about sometimes uh, you know we think about well it, we, we want to express joy in the things that happen to us that might not be good but uh, Lloyd made the, the comment about that afterwards and we talked about uh, in Hebrews 12 and other uh, places that point out that at the moment you're going through what you're going through uh, sometimes might not be pleasant of course when we, when we have the death of a loved one that's not pleasant how do you find joy in that you know death of a loved one or the sickness of a loved one or somebody that's been injured uh, you've, you've uh, lost your possessions you have financial difficulty you having uh, uh, marital problems or you having this that or the other how do you find joy in those kind of things but I think if, as we look at the, the end result, when we look at the afterwards of all of this, if we bear up under it, if we endure it, uh, if we believe in God that he's going to help us through uh, the trials and tribulations of life, uh, then those things will work out for good. And even if it doesn't work out on this side of eternity, it will eventually. And uh, so, sometimes we can't understand, you know, it's kind of like... Um, uh, this book that I read one time, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? You know, sometimes we don't understand, we don't understand all the whys and wherefores. Sometimes, we talked the other day about it a little bit, sometimes we may be chasing of the Lord. I don't know when that's occurring, whether that's a chasing of the Lord when something is not going good for me or not. But what he's saying and what James is saying in here is whatever the difficulty is, that we're going through, notice what he says, count it all joy when you fall into these uh, diverse temptations. And he's not talking about those things that are testing us to the point of sinning or putting a roadblock in front of us to cause us to stumble, even though that is what he's talking about in verses 12 and 13, uh, when he said, blessed is man that endures temptation when he's tried to receive the crown of life, that no man say when he's tempted on tempted of God and so forth. That's the, that's the trial and tribulation and temptation to sin. Can't blame God for that. But what he's saying here in verse um, 2 and 3 and 4 is not the, uh, not the trial and tribulation of causing us to stumble or causing us to sin, but he's just talking about something that is um, terrible or bad or tough that we're going through that will lead us if we endure it, if we, if we show the fortitude and the endurance. And Joel talks a lot about that, the, uh, defining the word patience as a endurance kind of thing that, uh, that, that, we, uh, that we bear up under. We said, let patience have a perfect word that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. In other words, let it play itself out without 
getting tremendously upset about it without striking out at others, without uh, the other, uh, the, the kind of things that may happen that people uh, don't bear up under it with patients. They use bad language or they strike out at the, the spouse or they, you know, do something else uh, that uh, doesn't demonstrate patience, it doesn't de demonstrate endurance. So what he's saying is that if we bear up under it, then eventually it's going to work out for our good. And we use verses like Romans 8, 28 that we always, uh, that's kind of one of those stock ones that we go back to, uh, that we know that all things work together good, then we love the Lord and so forth. Uh, so <clears throat> that's kind of what he's talking about here. He's not talking about being, uh, being tried to sin, even though later on in verses 12 and 13 it does. But then he goes into uh, the kind of things that we're having to uh, endure. And he's saying, when you're going through these trials and tribulations and difficulties, we need help to confront it. We need help to overcome it. So that's when verses 5 through 8 come in where he says, ask God for wisdom. Ask God for help. Ask God for wisdom in, in how to deal with the trying of your faith, the various, the various uh, hardships that you're undergoing. Ask God for help. And of course, that's not the only time we ask God for, uh, uh, or pray to God, of course. We know, know that. We thank Him for what He's done for us. And we ask Him in a lot of other, a myriad of things that, that we ask Him for, whether we are praying privately or publicly. Uh, but, but, but He's saying that it's very, very important when we're going through these trials, temptations, the trying of our faith, who do we look to? We look up. We look up. And we ask God to help with the assurance, and what he's saying is, with the assurance that God's going to give us what we ask for. If we're asking for wisdom, and we ask in the right way, we ask asking in faith, what does he say? He's going to give it to us. He's going to give to all. He's not going to chide us. He's not going to rebuke us. He's not, not going to uh, uh, think bad of us for asking him because he tells us over and over, ask, ask and you'll receive, ask. Seek and you'll find and so forth and so on. Go ahead, Charlie. Uh, I can't remember <clears throat> what verse it was in, but it said that uh, he gave us about... Throw it out. One of these guys will know who it is, where it is. Lord. I say rejoice. There's a lot of rejoicing in Philippians. I'm not sure if that's one of the passages that uh, you're referring to. There are other passages that, that point that out. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Is that the one you're talking about? Something like that. All right. That's, that's pretty close. I think that's in Philippians, isn't it? Philippians 4, 4. Yeah, Philippians 4, 4. I knew that these Bible scholars would know it. Just throw it out anywhere, Charlie. Then we got somebody to pick it up. Yes. All right, yeah, that's close enough. <clears throat> uh, let me uh, read just uh, two or three things that Wayne Jackson says uh, about it. He says, um, and he goes back and talks about the kind of things, keep in mind the kind of things that these people were dealing with, uh, the, the trials and tribulations, the persecutions, all of the things, uh, all of the things that are going on uh, with them. Who is he writing to? Right to Christians, but to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, uh, uh, some type of persecution that, uh, that had occurred, uh, perhaps uh, trying of their faith and so forth and so on. So, so he's addressing that, but of course that applies to us as well. Even though we may not be facing the same thing, we do face trials and tribulations, difficulties, discouragement, uh, and the various things, setbacks. Uh, we all face that to one degree to other, sickness, death, a uh, number of things that are common to all. And Jackson says this, uh, Wayne Jackson, what fortitude it would take to face the trials of a world hostile to Christianity with joy, yet this is what they were challenged to do. And, uh, and he uses, uh, we won't go back and read these, but uh, I think I referred to one of them last week, Romans 5 and verse 3, uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 10. He said it takes the testing of faith to produce endurance. In other words, if nothing ever happened to you, 
how you're going to uh, to be stronger and overcome things if everything is just smooth sailing, have no setbacks, no difficulties in life, no road roadblocks, no bumps in the road, everything just how you going to how you going to help the next generation to overcome things, for example. How are you going to help your children and your grandchildren to deal with things uh, that they're going to have to deal with if everything, if nothing bad ever happens in, in our life uh, itself? Patience doesn't develop in a vacuum, he said. But when repeatedly tested, it produces a maturity that does not lack. It completely equips one for facing adversity. And he refers to verses 3 and 4. If one lacks wisdom in handling difficulties, he may ask God for such, ask God for help. When the Lord gives, it is with overflowing abundance. <clears throat> you know, the Bible uh, talks about the 30-fold, the 60-fold, the 100-fold, the various things that, uh, uh, that God gives us in answer to uh, uh, our prayers. <clears throat> he may ask God, uh, God for such. If one lacks wisdom and handling difficulty, he may ask God for such. Uh, when the Lord gives it, he gives it, gives it with overflowing abundance. The Lord does not directly provide a miraculous transfusion of wisdom, but such comes through the revelation of Scripture and the heavenly orchestration of providence. Above all, the Christian must not doubt his heavenly Father. On the contrary, he must solicit the Lord with believing confidence. The doubter is like the turbulent sea, wholly unstable. Verse 6. The doubter will come up empty-handed. Faith is a condition for effective prayer. We'll go back to James 5, 16, other, other passages that would point that out. Uh, the, uh, the, the effects of fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much and believe, that you believe that you're going to get what you ask for and so forth. Moreover, the wishy-washy will be void of influence. Who has confidence in the unstable? And he, and he refers to verses 7 and 8. So as we look at... Um, as we look at that, let's just read it real quick. I know we read it last week, but if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Verse 5, they giveth to all men, the word uh, men there was uh, supplied by the translators, but it, it doesn't take anything away from the, uh, the gist of the, uh, the subject. We just talk about everybody, all men and women and, and all. You can just leave out the men. He giveth to all liberally and upbraideth not. He doesn't chide us. He doesn't rebuke us, and it shall be given him. So the, the question is, do we believe that? Look at verse 6. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man, the man who wavers, the man who doubts, uh, the man who questions, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. <coughs> so he's probably when he's asking if any of you lack wisdom he's probably referring to uh, the kind of wisdom as uh, Albert Barnes, Barnes says that w which they would need in the various trials and tribulations and difficulties that he just talked about there in, in verses uh, 3 and 4 <coughs> for there is nothing he said in which Christians more feel the need of heavenly wisdom than in regard to the manner in which they should bear trials and what they should do and the perplexes, disappointments, bereavements that come upon them. You know, there's an old saying, what you do about what happens to you is more important than what happens to you. <coughs> In other words, how do we handle? How do we handle that? How do, uh, and and he's, what he's saying here, one of the ways that you handle that, the best way to handle that <coughs> is to go to God for help. Ask God to help us through. Uh, the various uh, trials and tribulations of life. And in this case, if you're not really sure about how to deal with the death of a loved one, sickness, uh, setback, poverty, uh, loss of various things uh, in life, what he's saying is we need to go to God knowing that, uh, that God is going to uh, help us. Let him ask of God, he says. Let me, let me go a little bit farther. Uh, they give it to all men liberally. So we go and we ask God, uh, we ask God for help with the assurance uh, that God will. Now, Barnes makes a, a statement here. I want to read this uh, to you and get your thoughts if you want to comment on it. <clears throat> because I want to go to two or three other verses to, to, to indicate that there's, not that there's something different about it, but how God blesses, there's a sense in which God blesses all, and then there's a sense in which 
uh, we're going to God to ask him for particular things. In this case, we're asking God for wisdom. Let me just read the statement that he makes. The object of the writer was to encourage those who felt their need of wisdom to go and ask it of God. And then here's the statement that he makes uh, that I want to uh, focus on for just a minute. And it would not contribute anything to furnish such a specific encouragement to say of God that he gives to all men liberally whether they ask or not. I want to go back to that in just a second. In the scriptures, the promise of divine aid is always limited to the desire. No blessing is promised to man that is not sought. No man can feel that he has a right to hope for the favor of God who does not value it enough to pray for it. No one ought to obtain it who does not prize it enough to ask for it. So that's the gist of what he's saying here about wisdom. We need to ask God for help, knowing that God will help us in, uh, in that particular uh, situation. And keep in mind who he's writing to. He's writing to Christians, to the 12 tribes or to the Christians scattered abroad, you and I being in that uh, company as well, that we have the assurance that what we ask God for help-wise is going to be provided. Now, that brings up the question, well, what about all these other people that, you know, Job had the problem about why, you know, when they questioned Job, well, you've done something, the reason these, all these bad things are happening to you, you're a bad person. Of course, early on, uh, it's not revealed to Job, but it's revealed to us as we look at it, of, of what was happening, the test, uh, the test of Job and uh, and so forth. There's no one like him in the earth, perfect, upright man, and so forth. God valued him very, very high, and, and of course, he allowed these things uh, to happen to him uh, there all through Job. But Job's, Job's question, and I want to read this in just a second. Job's question is then, why, why are all these other people that I see, and you and I can have a little issue with that too probably sometimes, all these people that seem to be doing so good, they are prospering, Job said. He said they even live to a ripe old age, and nothing seems to happen to them. They don't regard God like Job was regarding God, like Job believed in God. He made sure that his sons were living right and doing right uh, there in the first chapter. Uh, unless they do something wrong, he was, uh, Job was right there uh, to try to help them and so forth and so on. So let's look at that for just a second. Uh, there's a couple of verses that I want to look at in Job and one in, uh, one in Psalm 37 and also uh, one in Matthew 5. And just to kind of get your thoughts on it if you would. Uh, but in Job, um, somebody, somebody turn to Job real quick uh, if you got it uh, before I can get to it. It's in Job uh Job 21, uh, verses 7 through 13. If anybody has that, just jump in and read it for me. Job 21, 7 through 13. Got it. Okay, Bill, go ahead. Under the wings of love would become old, just become mighty in power, their descendants are established with them in their sight, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull breeds without failure. <coughs> The cow calves without miscarriage. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance, and they sing to the to the tambourine and harp, and rejoice to the sound of the flute. They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. What about that one? <laughs> Job kind of he kind of summed it up, which you know we look at it sometimes. Some of these people that's not regarding God about anything. And yet, so when Barnes says that it's uh, the, the blessings of God are specific to the request or the asking, um, and I, I don't want to quibble with Barnes because he, he's a, a bigger Bible scholar than I am, but the, the, the point is there's a sense in which no matter how we live our life, God blesses to some degree every good and perfect gift is from above he sends the rain on who? Just. And the sunshine on who? Just and the, unjust. the just and the unjust. The air that we breathe. You, you just think of the billions of people on this planet that care nothing about God or that they're worshiping a false God, have no interest in the true and living God, and yet they seem to be pretty blessed in a lot of ways. Many of them, many of them grow old. 
everything is good. They're at least 80, aren't they, Bill? Look at what he says there. He says, the, li the, the, the wicked live and become old. How old is old? Well, 80, 70. <laughs> but you know, the Go ahead, Lord. story of justice boils down to one thing to me. It shows that a man can be faithful to God no matter what happens to him, what he loses or, or what happens to him physically. He can still be faithful to God. Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about it. As a matter of fact, that, that, was, that was part of the thing, wasn't it, is to, to see whether he would yeah, right. in all kind of difficulties. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're faced with a little bit. And that's what we're kind of talking about on our part. When we're faced with the trials and tribulations and difficulties, disappointments, discouragement, defeats, all the things that happen to us, can we look to somebody like Job? Can we look to uh, somebody like the psalmist that he described it in Psalm 37? I'm going to read just a second. Uh, we, we need to look at it that way, and that's, that's kind of what we're talking about, about enduring, staying the course in spite of all these things that may happen to us. I want to turn to just, just real quick, to, it, it kind of piggybacks uh, what we're talking about there with Job, uh, but in Psalm 37, uh, here's what the, the psalmist said, uh, it doesn't say who, who wrote the psalm, it doesn't say David wrote it, but, uh, but let's just read it. Psalm 37, verse 7. Rest in the Lord, notice this. And here's that word patient again. Mm -hmm. And wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. Notice this. Because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Well, who's the guy that's prospering in his way? The guy that's bringing wicked things to pass. And he's still prospering. He's still, he's still doing okay. Uh, he said, he says, cease from anger, forsake uh, wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. The evildoers eventually are going to be cut off. Those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth, and he goes on and on and on. So then when you, um, so when you look at uh, the, the different things that, that happen to people who have no interest, no interest whatsoever in God, or no interest in the true God, <clears throat> there, go ahead, yes. I'm sorry, but Psalm 73, the other side, got a clip of that. Same thing, Asaph. He he had that same idea, and he said he almost left God because of it. Yeah. Until I went into the house of the Lord, Lord and, and saw the end result. Yeah. Right, and saw the end result. There you go. That's a, that was a good one. I wish I'd gotten. I appreciate you bringing that one up. So the, the end result, though, whatever that end result is, is going to be positive. If, if you read the whole Psalm 37, I love Psalm 37, because the end result is, when you boil it all down, within that passage, he talks about the, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way, and though he fall, he'll, he'll not be utterly cast down. God, God is going to provide him uh, the means of rising and going again. Uh, particularly Psalm 37, 20, verse 23, 24, and 25, and other places that, that point that out. And then the very end, though, is that there's going to be a judgment. And those last five or six verses in Psalm 37 point that out, that what's happening now is not all there is to it. And so even if, uh, and, and Job had it right, that there's um, the, the wicked... May, may be flourishing in this life, they may have an abundance of wealth, abundance of good things happening to them in this life, but what about the end result? What about the end result uh, of what's going to happen in the, uh, in the final analysis? Uh, and, and this kind of goes back to what we're saying about uh, God, God blessing everybody in, in a sense. In Matthew 5 and verse um, 45, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So there's a sense in which, that, that's the thing about it, when I, when I was reading uh, Albert Barnes' commentary, that, there's really no one to bring that out, that yes, we ask God, but and we know about the conditions of prayer in our life, and, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, but there's a sense in which there are others that are blessed and they care nothing about God. And they have, they have a lot of uh, financial uh, prowess. Uh, they, they may become rich. They may become famous. Uh, all the things. They, they may be a great athlete, maybe a great musician. 
you know, they're an atheist or whatever. God gives them the, the ability to do certain things. So, so whatever you have comes from God. And, you know, Paul addressed that point too. So why, why do you glory as if it didn't? Because it, it did, whether it's, whether you're talking about it received, we as a Christian receive it or somebody else received it, there's a sense in which uh, everybody's blessed. But then there is a specific thing uh, that when you have uh, the, the bereavements and various difficulties and so forth, we talked about it uh, before, and I've heard different ones you talk about. What do people who don't have God do when they do have these difficulties and these setbacks and uh, they have nobody to look to to help them overcome? I'm, I'm talking about from a, a spiritual standpoint, mental standpoint, uh, to get through uh, some of the things that, w that we all face and we, we have to get through. Uh, you know, whether it be the worst thing to be the death of children or you know the, your grandchildren or uh, you know one of your children going astray or uh, the, the various things that happen to us in life how do you get through it without the help of God well some survive it I'm not saying they don't but I'm just saying that you and I can have, have that peace of mind there's a, there's a sense of which we have that peace of mind that passes all understanding that somebody else uh, perhaps may not have. Israel, you had a thought, I think. Yes, sir. You were talking about how that these people seem to do well, but it kind of reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 6. They have their reward. Yeah. I mean... It's in this life, right? It's in this life, and that's yeah. it. That's it, yeah. They already have their reward. Yes, even those that, 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 that pray, they even in, in their prayer life, you know, they, they people pat them on the back, oh, that's a great prayer. They're standing on the street corner praying, and and so forth and so on. He said, but that's not the way that it is or should be with you. They have their reward in this life. So there's something, there's, there's something better um, down the road uh, for us, even if uh, it doesn't occur in this life. I'm talking about materially and other things that, uh, uh, that we look. So God doesn't upbraid us. He talks about there, still finishing up the thought there. He doesn't, he doesn't reproach us, revile us. He doesn't chide us. Uh, man sometimes does, but, uh, but God uh, does not. And then uh, it says, and it shall be given him. Uh, now, but then he gives the condition about asking in faith. And this is where I want to focus here for just a, a few minutes before the bell uh, catches us. Uh, the thing about uh, uh, asking in faith. Uh, <clears throat> There, uh, well, one of my one of my favorite verses in the Old, Old Testament is uh, Proverbs three, five, and six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge Him. He'll direct your paths. So, do we believe that, or do we not believe that? Job believed it to the point that he said, even if, even if God doesn't bless me in the way that I'm asking, he said he even went so far as that though He slay me. Yeah. Yet will I serve him. Yet will I trust him. Yet will I, I, I be with God. It reminds me of the three Hebrew children. I, I love the, the expression that they, uh, uh, they expressed when they were called before the king and uh, they, they wouldn't bow down to that 90-foot tower and, and, uh, and so forth and so on. And he, he gave them a chance to, to, to get right. And uh, they said uh, they weren't going to do it. And they, said, they made the statement that, that our God will deliver you deliver us from whatever it is that our punishment is. But then, then they made this statement, but even if he doesn't, we're still going to be true to God. We still believe in God. We still believe in God. Even if he allows us, kind of like Job said, though he slay me, yeah, well, I trust him. Yeah, well, I believe him. And the three Hebrew children had almost the same expression that even if he doesn't, we know that God can. We believe that he will. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to your God and so forth. We still believe God. We still believe in God. Even if he allows us to die, basically, I think is what they were saying. Lord, you have thought. Yeah. I think when he talked about, we like that wisdom, ask, ask to God to give it to us liberally. And part of the use of that wisdom is knowing what to ask God. Yeah. Uh, ask according to his will. You yep. know, there's one verse where it talks about, 
you asking him not because you asked him this. Yep. So we need to ask things. That, I mean, it's not going to do me any good to ask the Lord for a million dollars by tomorrow. I just, right. I, I wouldn't have much faith in that. Yep. That's right. <laughs> but if we ask things according to His will that He does do, we we can have that. Absolutely. Prayer Absolutely. That, uh, Lloyd uh, used that verse because I had that in just an, another statement too. Uh, the one who's referring to is James chapter 4 uh, and verse 3 you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a um, let's see what was the other one I had down I, I had another one Lord in that connection I think it's Matthew 7 uh, Matthew 7 Matthew 7 7 and 8 I believe I had it kind of in the same connection um, I said, everyone ask and receive so yeah. it. So, so he's, he, he's asking us to ask, and we'll receive. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth, and, and, and so forth. It, uh, it, those that knock, it'll be open. But like Lord said, and, and what James is saying there later on in James chapter 4, uh, you ask, but you don't receive, and there's a reason for it, uh, because you may consume it on your own lust, and, uh, and so forth, and, and uh, so on. Uh, when we talk about the, uh, and this is what I want to get to here for just a minute, when we, when we ask about, when we talk about conditions of prayer uh, for you and me uh, as Christians, what are some of those conditions? Let me just read the ones that I have, and y'all chime in if uh, you will. Uh, Lord already mentioned uh, one. Uh, it's according to His will. Uh, some of the conditions that, that, that He, James, already mentioned here in James chapter one. Let him ask in faith, nothing doubting. Okay, so. Uh, we believe that whatever we ask God for, if we ask for the right things, we know that he can uh, do that. Do we believe that he will? So we ask in faith. Uh, the effects of the power of righteous man, the effects of the power of righteous man availeth much. So uh, it has to be according to his will. It has to be a fervent prayer, just not a, a, a happenstance mm -hmm. thing, just a Somebody said, well, I said a little prayer and so forth and so on. A fervent prayer, James said in James 5 and verse 16, uh, and, it, and it's from a righteous man. Uh, so that's, uh, that's part of the uh, condition. Now, uh, what about, do y'all have another before I go to my next thought? There may be another thing or two that I didn't jot down there. But even in those situations, and we talked about this before, uh, way before we got into the book of James. But uh, I've mentioned this before. But here, here are some of the answers to prayers. He may say yes. He may say no. He may say not now. Wait patiently for the Lord. Maybe down the road. Not right when we want it. And then the fourth thing that I've got is sometimes he may say that that's not for your good and one of these, uh, one of the commentators mentioned that, that it's not for your good I have something better in store for you down the road it's going to be better than what you ask for, so to me those are the four uh, answers to prayer we don't get everything that we pray for and let me, let me just give you uh, three uh, examples of great people who didn't get what they prayed for, you remember uh, you remember David and when he had the uh, uh, baby with Bathsheba and how uh, he prayed to God for seven days that the child would be spared and the child wasn't spared. Seven days. He prayed seven days. <clears throat> Paul prayed at least, we know, three times. The Bible means he, he sought the Lord thrice. Second Corinthians uh, 12, down about verse 7, 7, 8, 9 that that thorn in the flesh would be removed from him. It's hard to find a better person in the New Testament than the Apostle Paul. Hard to find a better one in the Old Testament than David. There's some that would equal him probably, but the Bible says he's a man after God's own heart and so forth and so on. How God, the uh, sweet psalmist of Israel, greatest king of Israel, asked for that baby to be spared. What did that baby do wrong? He asked him to, to, to be spared. He wasn't spared. And then what about the Lord himself? How hard did he pray in the garden? If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And in Hebrews, it talks about that it was as if great, great drops of blood, or he, or he makes a comment about the 
tears or with strong, strong crying. Yes, the guy that he was praying three different times or, or asked God for, uh, to keep him from that if it be God's will, if it's possible. God heard his prayer, but he didn't give him his request. So we have, and that, that's not the only example, but that's just three that received a no answer. They, they, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't granted. So, but it's kind of like, but it's kind of like Job and the three Hebrew children and others. Even if he doesn't, and that's what Jesus said, if it's your will, but nevertheless, if it's not your will, that's okay. It let it be according to your will, and that's the way that we need to approach God. Uh, I think in prayer, uh, as we look at the various conditions of prayer, and we know that uh, that, that we expect Him to answer our prayer in a positive way. We believe that he will, but even if he doesn't, how do we respond to that? Even if he doesn't, then we still believe God, we still trust in God. Uh, we don't throw God under the bus and say, you know, he didn't grant me, you know, what he asked for and, uh, and so forth. Charlie, you had a comment, I think? Uh, yeah. It says uh, in Colossians, <clears throat> Two, four, uh, <clears throat> three, fourteen, it says, and above all things, put, put on charity, which is a bond of effectiveness. Yeah, there you go. That charity and love, that's the, that's the strongest one. Faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love, absolutely. Uh, Albert Barnes makes this statement, then I'll leave it and we'll go, we'll, we'll go on to the next one. He says that um, we, cannot, we cannot hope to obtain any favor from God if there's not faith. And we're sure that it is, but we must be sure that it's according to His will to grant it to us. We may come to Him with the utmost confidence if it's according to His will. If it's according to His will, He hears us, He, he, he provides it if it's according to His will. Uh, and and that uh, that it will be granted if it's according to His will, and that's the way that we pray it. In this case, we sh we should come to God without a doubt that if we ask with a proper spirit, uh, the very thing that we ask will be bestowed on us. We cannot, in all other cases, be so sure that what we ask for will be for a good, or that it will be according uh, to His will. He's talking about we pray for a lot of things. And so sometimes, uh, as Lord was talking about there in James 4, it's um, we ask amiss, uh, we, uh, we don't ask for the right things, uh, or we may not ask strongly enough, or we, we, we doubt that we're going to get it, any number of things, any number of conditions that it might not be granted. But even if it's just an outright um, denial or putting it off for a period of time, then... Um, we still trust God and believe God that it, it, it was for our good. It was for our good that He answered it the way He answered it. I guess is the way I was trying to put it. Sometimes our prayers, if they were answered, affect other people. I remember Ronald Underwood talking about one time. Said, "What well, if you pray for rain? So I got my crop in. I need rain. Well, your neighbor ain't got his crop in. Yeah, he don't yeah. need rain. Yeah. You know, so, so what if you pray for Andrew someone else? Yeah. Not your reason it doesn't yeah. answer. Yeah. And sometimes it's kind of like the, the old country song. I can't remember which one. It is. Thank God for unanswered prayers. I'm not yeah. sure which. One. Yeah. Of course, uh, it may not be an unanswered prayer, but it may be a, a a no answer to the prayer or whatever. But you know, we, we may be maybe dating someone, and man, this is a this is one for me, and so forth. And someone didn't work out, and said, uh, but now I got one that I have 58 years, you know. So uh, <laughs> that sort of thing. So uh, that that's the kind of thing that uh, that we need to look at as well. That it's. Uh, according to his will, we ask in faith, but even if he doesn't, we know that God does all things well, and that's the trust and faith that we have as Christians in him, that, that he doesn't make any mistakes. So even if it's not the way that we want it, and it's, it happens the way he wants it, it'll be better for us down the road than, uh, than, than maybe we wanted at the time, and we thought we couldn't, couldn't do without it, as the Lord was saying. 
So nothing wavering, nothing doubting. Uh, I mentioned that he that wavers like a wave of the sea, and I was tossed to and fro with, with every uh, with the wind. It, it uh, uh, is up and down and so forth and so on. And that's kind of the unstable man that uh, that he's talking about there in uh, uh, verse six and seven. Let not that man think that he he shall receive anything of the Lord. Uh, so if if uh, we're hoping for favor from God. Uh, that we have to have confidence in him. He sees the heart, uh, have that trust in him uh, that, uh, that we need to have and have the proper state of mind uh, that we can expect God to answer our prayers in the right way, whether it's, uh, it's what we want or not. And the double-minded man in verse 8 uh, is the one who basically has uh, two thoughts or two, or two uh, separate things. He, uh, he waves, he's uh, inconsistent or inconstant that uh, he has no settled principles he just kind of goes from one to the other uh, he's a doubter and uh, that, that that's a person he says that's not going to, to receive anything of the Lord because he's unstable in all his ways and then he takes it a step further and he says that let not that man think that he'll receive anything of the Lord so it, it, he's not just asking for wisdom but it seems to be launching out and saying, uh, no matter what we ask, uh, in that case, in respect to everything, uh, whatever whatever it is that we request of God, uh, that He's saying that, uh, in a in a general sense, that that man who is doesn't have the faith, uh, trust in God, uh, to lead him and so forth on any other subject or any other request, uh, that that uh, that man is not going to receive anything uh, from the Lord. All right, any thought before we get into verse 9? Because you kind of changed his course a little bit beginning in verse 9. Go ahead, Charlie. All right, First John 4, 4 said, Ye, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in ye than he that is in the world. Absolutely, absolutely. We have, we have that confidence in Him. Absolutely. Let me just mention one other verse before we leave that with two other verses, real quick. In First John five fourteen, and this kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier uh, about uh, having uh, asking according to God's will, or uh, yeah. And this is the the confidence. This is the confidence that we have in Him and in, in God that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And then one other in First John. In 1 John 3 and verse 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, notice it, and this goes back to the righteous living that we're talking about, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So there are many verses um, throughout uh, that give some conditions of prayer uh, about asking in faith, the kind of life that we're living, asking for the right reasons, asking in the right way, uh, all of these things uh, are conditions, as we see, we might say, of uh, acceptable prayer. Then when he gets into verse 9, he, he kind of changes the subject a little bit here, where he talks about um, a person who may be uh, thought of less than uh, others. Uh, he's, he's not rich. It may, it may even be in poverty where he, t where he talks about the brother of low degree, a person who is of low estate contrasted with the rich and how both ought to be thankful to God. We'll get to that a little bit next week. Both ought to be thankful, maybe for different reasons, but both ought to be thankful to God. Um, he says, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he's exalted, but let the, the rich Rejoice in that he's made low. The word rejoice is not there, but that's that's the uh, that's an elliptical uh, expression. But the rich in that he's made low. In other words, when he says, "Let the, let the uh, brother low degree rejoice in his in that he is exalted," but let the rich in that he is made low rejoice. And there's a reason for him to to rejoice as well, uh, even though um, he may lose all of his possessions. But there's a reason for him to rejoice. And of course, I think we can all figure that out because he, he realizes now that he's going to eventually pass away. He's going to be just like that grass that wilts and melts and, 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 uh, and dries up like a lot of our grass and shrubs and stuff all right now. 
that that but it, but it brings him to his senses to let him know that his riches aren't going to prosper in the day of judgment and he in, in other words he's brought low and now he says he's no different than this grass that passes away so I've got the time and opportunity to get my life straight so I'm going to rejoice in that, that that God has brought me to my senses that's kind of the, the essence of what uh, I think he's talking about there we'll, we'll get into that next week thank you guys for your good comments your good attention <laughs>